All right, everyone. Welcome to the Army Mad Scientist Initiative. Uh, what we're doing today is a virtual talk uh, with Dr. Ajit Mon and Mr. Paul Kobal. We're going to talk about narrative warfare. And this is really the last event in uh, what has been a phenomenal series for us, along with uh, Georgetown uh, University Center for Security Studies, where we've looked at weaponization of information over this whole summer. So based on the fact that COVID-19 happened and we couldn't have a physical event, uh, we've been very fortunate to partner with Georgetown CSS still uh, and put on this phenomenal campaign. Uh, so what Army Mad Scientist Initiative is, is a group that works with tech and industry, academia, and other parts of government so that we can envision the future and what that looks like. And so through this campaign, what we had was uh, several events. We looked at Mr. Vincent O'Neill came in and talked to us about the information disruption industry. We had August Cole and Pete Singer, the authors of Ghost, Fleet, and Burning, come on to talk to us about weaponization of social media and fictionalized intelligence. Then we had Drs. Mark Posard and Christopher Paul from RAND Corporation to talk about manufacturing disinformation with AI. Then we were fortunate to work with uh, the University of New York, Albany, uh, with the Center for Advanced Red Teaming to have a vignette war game, which was really exciting. And then we featured a panel from Georgetown University's Center for Security and Emerging Technologies, where we looked at how AI speeds up disinformation. And then we had an all-day conference featuring uh, pro baseball writer Keith Law, Mr. Lewis Shepard, Kara Frederick from the Center for New American Security. It was a great event where we kind of looked at the problem and solution set spaces uh, when it came to disinformation and the weaponization of information. So if you go to our blog, madsideblog.tradoc.army.mil, we have all the relevant links to our All Partners Access Network site. You do not need a cap card to get on there. And you'll be able to get on and go see the uh, content and videos that came out of all those events. So this is really the culmination of a period of events that we've had looking in the space. Uh, and I'm really excited to have uh, Dr. Mon and Paul on today because I've been following their work and, and supporting uh, what they're looking at in terms of narrative warfare because we've looked at this problem space a lot. Now we get to bring in two individuals that are going to tell us all about how we can actually operationalize this. How can we go on the offensive, so to speak, when it comes to narrative? So I'm really excited to have both of you here. Um, I'll allow you to introduce yourselves and uh, excited to have this panel. Thanks, Luke. Um, I'm Ajit Mon. I'm uh, the CEO of Narrative Strategies and I teach uh, at Arizona State University in the Global Security Program. Um, I thought we could start talking first about how we at Narrative Strategies use the term narrative. We have a very specialized meaning when we use that term. And it comes out of narrative identity theory. Narrative identity theory is a philosophical and psychologically based description of how people, individuals that is, create their identities in the process of telling their stories. So that when we tell about ourselves, we're not just reflecting, you know, history or describing events, but we are editing and we are framing and we are importantly giving meaning to those events in our lives. We're telling that story in a particular way, that is the form, and we're including particular content and not other content, and we're telling the story for a reason. And that's why we in include certain information and don't include inf certain other information. And in so doing, we create the person that we are. We create our identities in part by telling who we are. Um, as a graduate student, I did my uh, doctoral work on narrative identity theory. And after that, I, and then I should say too that I um, had, a, uh, though I consider myself a narrative identity theorist, mm -hmm. I, some problems with the way that it uh, projects a sort of Western take on identity, particularly where form is concerned, structure, the structure of the narrative. So I broadened it a bit to make it a more applicable, and I broadened the theory out to, to apply to small group identity, familial identity, tribal identity, 
national identity. So, and the, the basis of narrative identity theory, just to put it in a nutshell, is that through our narratives that we inherit, we learn very important things. One is that we learn who we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to behave because of who we're supposed to be. And the other thing we learn from our cultural narratives is how to process information. So people from different cultural narratives who have a different narrative background will, will process information differently. Um, and so let, let me just give an example of the distinction between narrative and stories because people often use them interchangeably and we don't. Um, and I think we have a slide for this. It's, I believe, slide three. Um, narrative is, I sometimes describe it in cultural terms as um, akin to uh, um, gravity in the physical environment. Gravity in the physical environment is something we simply deal with. We didn't ask for it. We're born into physical environments, and we learn to navigate in them with gravity as a feature in our physical environment without any direct instruction. Um, and so too, we are born into narrative environments. That's part of our cultural environment that we didn't choose. But nonetheless, very early on, some people say pre-verbally, we learn to navigate a culture with dominant narratives that are not of our choosing, but we don't really require instruction on how to navigate that environment. And by the time we are certainly young people, we've navigated it so well that we don't even think about it. I mean, since you woke up this morning, have you thought about gravity? You probably haven't. And yet you've navigated in a world in which there's gravity without even thinking about it. So too with narrative. We don't think about it. We just live in it and according to it. And we've internalized a lot of the cultural expectations that our narratives have imparted to us. Um, when we talk about disinformation and the weaponization of narrative, the reason it is so successful, um, is so dangerous, is so impactful, is because it is what is being weaponized is something that we're not completely conscious of. It is on the, I call it sort of the assumed level. Narratives are not something we think about, but they're not also completely unconscious. If I say the word narrative, you know what it is. Just like if I say the word gravity, you know what it is. But we just don't think of them, think of it much. We think about stories which come from narratives, which spring out of narratives, and we're highly conscious of telling them and listening to them and interacting with stories, and we find it very informative and influential and entertaining to deal with stories. But those stories come from cultural narratives that we are not very conscious of. So in this slide that you're looking at, the narrative is like the trunk of the tree. The underground, under the soil part is the unconscious part. And there are those elements of the unconscious in narratives. But then when you get into the, the, um, the twigs, um, those are stories. And then stories give rise to other forms of communication, like tweets and messages and, and so forth. So, and let me give you an example of a story and distinguish it from a narrative so we get really clear on the distinction between narratives and stories. In the Western world, a formative, dominant cultural narrative is that of the heroic quest of the rugged individual. It's just one example. Um, and, and it goes, you know, you, you're familiar with it. It goes, you know, something like uh, there's the little guy up against the system, up against the empire, up against um, the forces of nature, up against the gods, up against some overwhelming or seemingly overwhelming odds. And the hero of that narrative separates himself out from the group, distinguishes himself in some way, 
and quests, goes on a quest, and we root for him. He's the little guy, he, and he, it's a difficult quest, and he gets knocked down a few times, and we, the audience, we root for him to get back up, get on his feet, or get on his horse, if we're Americans, and um, battle on, and he does. And at the end of the narrative, the, rug, the, the rugged individual, the hero of the story, has changed in some important way. He is identifiably different because of this quest and because of the process he went through. So that is a cultural narrative that is very influential in the Western world. Influential such that our stories, our personal stories, our national stories, our familial stories, mimic that content and that structure. So we have, I mean, just think of all the movies and the books and the comic books that you, that repeat this theme of the rugged individual separating from the crowd, taking on some sort of challenge, whatever it may be, and coming out different at the end. So we have, so if I ask an American audience, for example, um, what stories do you live by? They are not going to say, and believe me that nobody ever has said, I'm living the, the, you know, the quest of the rugged individual I'm on a heroic quest. They don't say that, but they tell a story that, that mimics that quest, both in form and in content. They tell about Rocky Balboa. You know, they may identify with him. They, may, they identify somehow with the underdog, with the little guy up against odds. And that narrative is so influential, in fact, that even a person who doesn't, who hasn't faced those sorts of odds, who hasn't struggled like that, who hasn't perhaps come out the other end a different person, even that kind of person will identify with the cultural narrative and assume that they are supposed to tell their story in such a way. That's the way, that's one example of a way in which cultural narratives influence even our particular story, what we're able to tell, what we don't tell, um, how we structure our stories. So that is how we use narrative, the term narrative in um, at narrative strategies. Narrative is intimately involved with identity and meaning. So the narratives that we are born into inform us about who we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to behave. And they also tell us how to process incoming information. So if there's two things to remember about narrative in discussing narrative identity theory, the, the most important things to remember are that they have everything to do with identity and narratives have everything to do with meaning. So when it comes to disinformation, when disinformation takes, I mean, people are often wondering, well, why can't we simply counter disinformation with facts? with the truth. The reason disinformation is sometimes more influential than the truth, in my opinion, is because the disinformation was better told than the truth. And what that means is that it was storied. And that means that the story grafted onto an already existing cultural narrative, which was more meaningful to the audience than the facts. Because narrative is all about the meaning of the facts. It's not about the facts. And if it's about, if there are lies, then narratives tell the meaning of the lies. They don't, you know, countering the lies with truth isn't a narrative strategy. A narrative strategy is to tell the meaning of the truth and to tell the meaning of the lies, what difference it makes to the audience. That's why we talk about narrative warfare. We do not, we're not talking about information warfare because we're not fighting over the information. We're fighting over what the information means. And that's where 
we need to fight. That's where we need to intervene. So um, when it comes to influence, um, if I'm going to influence an audience, I need to know what narrative their culture has, what is the dominant narrative in that culture? And what has that narrative, what does that narrative teach individuals about who they're supposed to be, how they're supposed to behave, and how they're supposed to process information? Because I can sit at my office all day long and construct a very brilliant message. And I can find the perfect messenger to relay this message. But if I can't predict how my audience is going to interpret that information that I send, I'm wasting my time. I need to deliver a message that will be received in the way I want it to be received. And to know that, I have to do some identity analysis. I have to do some narrative analysis of that person's culture. Um, so I think I'll, I'll let Paul address, you know, I, I'll shut up now and um, let Paul go. Thanks, Gigi. Can, uh, let's see, can we go on to the next slide, please? There we go. Um, let's see. First of all, I'm Paul, and I've been out of uniform since 2015. And I finished my career, uh, probably the last three quarters of it, uh, working for the special operations community as a practitioner in what was called then IO. I think they're transitioning to IW now. But as Gigi just mentioned, or Dr. Bond just mentioned, we're not in an IW fight. We're really in a narrative into narrative warfare because everything we do is about influence. Anyway, I want to say, first of all, I would like to thank Luke and Matt and everybody, Ian and everybody at the initiative for hosting this because as far as I'm concerned, being able to influence in the national security world is the number one thing that we have to be able to do. And it's something we have utterly failed at since the end of the Cold War. So we're gonna to have to get on our game. Anyway, I, I'm gonna throw out a radical thought now. And it was also one of the questions that uh, Luke and Matt and everybody teed up. Everybody always says, well, where does influence play or IO play, for example, in operations? Well, here's the radical thing. Every single operation is influence. Even if you're shooting at somebody, you're trying to get them to quit or change your position. Every single thing that we do is influence. So at the end of the day, every strategy, every campaign, every operation, every tactical support operation, it's all influence. You're trying to achieve something and change folks on the other side's behavior. At the same time, you're trying to maintain a relationship with the people in the environment you're operating in, and you're trying to maintain support at home. Everything you do is about influence. At the end of the day, for the things that Dr. Mon just expressed, if a person, if we don't explain the meaning of what we're doing, then our adversaries and our allies and partners will be absolutely confused. And I assure you that our adversaries will fill in the vacuum if we're leaving a blank as far as, as, far as explaining the meaning of what we're up to. All the stimulus is coming up, folks. Words, actions, interplay with other individuals, other organizations, other nations. If we don't stand up and explain what that means, and this, you know, extremists do this to us all the time. Russia is way ahead of us. We're still operating 99.9% .9 of the time. We're still operating in a week or two weeks or maybe a three or four days after the event. And we can't keep doing that if we're going to maintain any viability in the world. So if we can understand that, we understand the, critical, the criticality of narrative principles to influence. Everything we do is influence, and we need to get operations and actions in sync under the, with the understanding that influence is the objective, or we're not going to go anywhere. And Russia and China and everybody else is going to keep beating our pants off about it. So there's five things I have up here that I think you need to know when it comes to deploying a working national narrative warfare, national security strategy. Number one, I think most folks would agree, or you probably wouldn't be in this uh, meeting, this webinar today, 
is that the national security structure that we use for influence is literally obsolete. There's a couple of rusting parts that still work a little bit, but there's no functioning vehicle to take it anywhere. Every, we have millions of meetings, we have millions of working groups, and we have very few decision makers and the authorities are passed up so high that we rarely can operate. The problem with narrative is it requires, as a tool of influence, as the core of your influence, narratives require narrators. And narrators are not just key leaders, which we have some obsession in the U.S. national security community of thinking that only key leaders are the ones that can narrate. No. Everybody that interacts with your target audience is a narrator. Every entity that interacts with your target audience is a narrator. Those folks need to be conversational with their audience in real time. And they have, need to have the, the wherewithal, the resources, and the authorities to have that conversation and just keep it between the lines. You can't staff everything ad nauseum and wait for a response. If not, you're going to be OBE. So number two, the truth is that the U.S. national security community, it doesn't understand narrative. It's one of those words, ends up in staff meetings, it ends up in the press. At the end of the day, most folks don't understand narrative. The GD with Dr. Baum was just talking about that. Some folks say story, some folks say it's a strategic communication tool, but they don't understand the identity and the meaning piece. If we don't latch into that, and latch into the basic formula that I'll talk to you about in a second, we're not going to be able to compete with our adversaries because I assure you, Russia on some level gets the narrative aspect, the core narrative aspect of narrative warfare. China is trying to figure out. They're trying to use AI of all things to figure out the narrative identity, but it's not there yet because if you can't analyze narrative identity and under actually understand what it is, you're not going to get there. Nobody's going to make, AI is not going to figure it out. Machine learning will, will not figure it out. Number three, like, I'm just kind of repeat myself on this one, but our adversaries are beating our pants off. How many years, more than a decade, we spent fighting radical Islam? And at the end of the day, it's not only existing, but there are far more extremist elements out there. And you know what? They do it with a narrative. They, and they, for example, AQ has a kind of a standard narrative. They're purists. They've had the same, same narrative that existed now for the last, I don't know, 30 years. And ISIS, they have a similar narrative, but they also evolved their narrative to fit the circumstance. We spend working groups and months trying to figure out what they, what they have evolved to, but we don't have any engagement in the information environment or whatever we're going to call that the narrative environment. The outcome of that is number four, you lose your audience. When you lose your audience, you're restricted to and a victim of counter narratives. You know what? And I think Dr. Baum, I'm sure Dr. Baum will agree with me on this. Counter narratives don't work. Unless counter narratives are part of an overall narrative strategy, think of counter narratives as a football game. Counter narratives are playing defense. But you're playing defense when nobody wants to listen to you. If you don't have an alternate compelling narrative that people are hearing from top to bottom, you're already losing. You can't win a game solely on defense. That's just, that's all there is to it. Number five, if you can't understand the principles that make up narrative, you can't understand influence. Because at the end of the day, influence is about, actually, I'm going to tell you a couple things. One, Miriam Webster says that influence is the power of passive causing an effect in an indirect or intangible way. Here's my version of it from a military national security perspective. And it's a lot of words, but you guys will get these slides later. The power of capacity, let's see, my version is influence done well is achieved by a complex and intricate choreography of sustained actions, words, related activities wrapped around a core narrative that continually modifies behavior in a manner supportive of our objectives. 
with everything that's going on, all those words and actions and diplomacy and business leverage, all the things in dime that we talk about all the time, there's a lot happening to people. As Dr. Bond talked about, everybody filters that input differently. And depending on how many shared layers of identity you have, then you will also behave similarly to other different to different groups. If we don't explain what we're doing to the folks in the middle of the warfare uh, and our adversaries in the support side, if we don't tell them what things mean, they're going to make it up on their own or even worse, our adversaries is going to make it up for them. Can we zoom ahead to the next slide, please? The stuff that we're talking about is literally a semester length grad course. Actually, probably it's about three or four courses, maybe a certificate program. And we're trying to cram it all into a few, few slides. But what we've done to help people understand the basics of building narrative principles is we've created our own formula, a copywritten formula. Narrative is the meaning plus the identity of the audience, which hopefully you can bond to yours. Content, whatever the heck you want to talk about. And that structure that Gigi was talking about, which is in the West, we basically have a story that's beginning, conflict, result, resolution of some sort. And if you go to Afghanistan where epic poetry is the standard, then that story, those characters will begin an odyssey or even in Greek, Greek uh, mythology, those characters will begin this odyssey that will touch on different pieces of things that are important in the identity of the audience. They may never come to a resolution or it may be open-ended. That's why you can always go back in history or skip ahead to the future. It doesn't make any difference because those are open-ended structures. So if you can get those four items at least locked down, you're going to be really close to the ballpark to being successful. Um, let's see, anything else there? Let's skip on to the next slide, please. Oh, I already got to that. <laughs> Guys, the stuff that we're talking about is so complex and so deep that what we're leaving here on these links, and trust me, when you go to our website, we don't get anything out of it, no, no click fees or anything like that. We have our publications, we have a, a whole doctrine library on low intensity conflict, influence, PSYOP, all that good stuff. There's a white paper there about why the US is failing in influence. And the last link is the book that Gigi and I just put out, which is tailor made for folks like you. It's a, literally a workbook to help people in the national security community understand narrative warfare, what it means to you, how to employ it, and be able to assess it. Now, I'm gonna wrap up my piece of the presentation and get to a lot of questions because typically these kind of presentations end up being very interactive and that's a great thing. But let me tell you something else for those that are here in the intelligence community in the IC. Our IC is currently not postured to be success successful. Let me go back, can we go back one slide please? I'm sorry. Okay, our current intelligence community is not postured to collect, analyze, create finished intelligence products and assess based on this formula. The stuff that makes up people's identity is not, it's not a demographic. It's not somebody's 39 years old, this is religion, this is how much money he makes, he lives in this neighborhood and he's got a great job that's never gonna go away. That's a little piece of his identity, but it's just the marketing demographics. If you want to go deeper, you're going to have, if you want to be effective in influence, you're going to have to go much deeper. What's this tribal affiliation? What is the way they resolve certain circumstances? Do they resolve certain circumstances? Is it important? Now we went to Afghanistan and went, I did part of five years straight in Afghanistan. I tried it the army's way the first time. And it wasn't a failure, but it was, I can't, I'm not going to say it was a success. I came home and dug deep into who Eastern Pashtuns were because that's where I was going to the next rotation. And you know what? I started using narrative without knowing the fact that it was narrative. In 2010, I was telling stories that could have been taken right out of the local 
tribal chiefs or the first among equals right out of his heritage. And it started working. And I continued it to use narrative as the core of every single thing I did. And I built a campaign every time I went out after that and did it. The Army, I mean, I, the, our, I've been around military intelligence community stuff for ages. You can see all the gray of my beard is earned. I've never heard the word narrative expressed in any training. Not even a clue. It makes it into a con up every now and then, but people don't know what it means. We've got to start collecting so that in a way that we can implement narrative, narrative principles. So we have to collect about the meaning. What is the meaning that we want the local audience to understand? What's the, what is their identity? What's the content that's going to resonate with them? And how do they tell their stories, that structure? We have to collect in the intelligence community, has to be trained to get to the bottom of each of those four items. That's at a bare minimum. It's going to take training just to teach people what all this stuff means and how to learn about their targeted audience. And the truth is, one analyst probably won't be able to do it. So there's a lot of revamping to do in the national security community in order to support, number one, influence, especially narrative-centric influence. I think I've run my mouth a fair amount now. And according to my notes, I think that's about it for right now. But it's up to Luke and everybody, but we can transition to questions. And there's a bunch of good ones I've seen so far. Anyway, go ahead, please. Yeah, absolutely. No, that was that was fantastic, Dr. Mon and Paul. I appreciate you both going through that. And we actually have a really a lot of great questions. And I think they're going to pour in even more as you continue to ask. Um, I did not get where I am today without knowing how to earn the brownie points. So the first question I have comes from a Mr. Lee Grubbs, who happens to be my boss. Um, so I think um, he, he has a really interesting question in that narratives seem to be deeply cultural. So do we have sufficient cultural and language expertise in the army, in the DOD and U S government to effectively shape impactful messages that will influence foreign population? We have not proven effective at this in the last 20 years. And that's, that's something you kind of talked about in your talk, Paul, is how do we, you know, do we really know what Eastern passions are all about? And do we, do we understand their identity? So do we have the tools in the DOD, in the larger government to do that? And if we don't, uh, I'm going to add as kind of the follow on, what do we need to ascertain to do that? Gigi, do you want to talk or do you want me to go ahead? Well, I sort of think we don't, but um, we don't have the information, but we have the tools. Um, and I don't know, you know, Paul is better able to speak about what the DOD, what tools the DOD has available. Um, but certainly there are a lot of people who know a lot about narrative um, who can be called upon to assist in, in acquiring the tools that we need to get the information we need. Paul? Yeah, let, let me throw this at you. Based on my experience, and, and I think I was fairly deeply involved until just this January with the National Security Committee that was preparing people to deploy and, and participate in influence. And I'm going to tell you right now, I never could find the cultural expertise, the expertise that came from a, any type of standardized training. The team I worked on, we went out and found our own experts. I know the soft guys, they have access to different cultural training. But to be honest, I didn't even think that the soft guys I worked with had the access to the best training as far as culture is concerned. And it's not just cultural knowledge. I think in order to, to get to the narrative identity that really makes it, you able to influence effectively, you've got to go past like taking your shoes off and showing the bottom of your feet kind of nonsense that we had early on in Iraq. You've really got to get into how families operate, the fact that it's a patrilineal society in Eastern Af well, most of Afghanistan. Uh, another example is 
for a while in the north, I used a narrative that was criminals versus, this is actually a good example for you. I used a, a narrative that was criminals versus terrorists. The IMU folks or all the Uzbeks in the north were absolutely terrorists, irredeemable. The local Taliban really wanted to um, reconcile. They really wanted to come in out of the cold. So I pitted IMU folks against the Taliban. And I would trigger both sides culturally by getting to know who they were so I could target the, all the Uzbeks as terrorists. Whenever it came across in media, messaging, I could reward Pashtuns. And at, at the end of the day, it broke their, their narrative bond, at least that part of my tour. And I didn't follow up on it afterward. That was my last tour there. So that kind of cultural intelligence, it, it's rare. The HTS system was dynamite when we could actually get access to the majority of it. But, it, you know, it faltered from, out of poor nourishment from the top, I guess. Anyway, that's the nicest way I can say it. Let me just tell you one little teeny quick story about perspective and culture. And I live in San Antonio. The biggest thing in San Antonio is the Alamo. Biggest thing, one of the biggest narrative myths in U.S. history, one of the great features of iconic features of U.S. history is the Battle of the Alamo. Well, in Texas, we like to think it's a bunch of patriots that banded together to fight an oppressive government for freedom and kind of that narrative that Gigi was talking about, the classic American narrative, pull up by your bootstraps, fight for freedom and beat the oppressors and institute freedom and good values. If you go south of the border, the exact same facts, it's about the Mexican army heroically marching 5,000 kilometers to put down a bunch of ungrateful insurgents. Same facts completely different meaning. It's, it's cultural. And there's a lot of sub, I, what I, we like to call a family of narratives. There's a whole bunch of supporting narratives to the meta narrative, the overall overarching narrative, depending on the community that you're working in. So anyway, I'll shut up. I kind of got on the soapbox there. Go to the next question, please. Oh, good, Paul. That's what the, our soapbox is there for. Uh, so I want to I want to close together um, one sentence, or rather, one question that's pretty interesting. I think, uh, and this comes really from two questions and, and a couple others, but from Dom Spears and uh, Hugh Blanche. And I apologize, Hugh, if I mispronounce your last name. Um, but really, based on a U.S. desire um, to not spread falsehoods to not um, to not spread things that are just not true um, and have this this narrative that's wrapped in in our truth, then how do we deal with that in terms of the speed um, that comes out with uh, our adversaries and their willingness um, to not be anchored in any kind of um, even truthiness sometimes, just general um, misinformation? How do we deal with that tension between those two? Gigi, once you get this piece, the initial piece, and I'll follow up with the operational piece, if that's okay with you. It's much easier to narrate than to play catch up. Um, it's going to be much more effective to narrate, a hundred times more effective to narrate than to do a counter narrative. And I'll address counter narratives in just a second. But your question was about the speed. If we lead with a narrative strategy that gets out ahead of the kinetics, even if we're dealing with kinetics, Genetics, uh, we're much more ahead. If we, uh, you know, if we can get there first, if our adversaries get there first, now we're left, you know, playing catch up. It's not the best position to be in. If, however, we are in that position, then I think it's imperative, if possible, not to address the count, the narrative of the, our adversaries, not to repeat it, not to amplify it but to move on from it, to sort of turn our, our heads the other way and redirect the, the, the information to our meaning. Um, let me say a word about counter narratives and why we're not a fan of counter narratives at narrative strategies. A lot of people think, oh, you guys do narratives. Okay, we need a counter narrative. Here's what, you know, and what we do is narrative strategy, which means multiple layers of strategy 
one of which is a counter narrative. Counter narratives are useful sometimes. You should have them. You should be able to create them. But there are problems associated with counter narratives. And the biggest problem is that you may be amplifying and legitimizing the adversarial narrative simply by, by repeating it, even when you're putting a negative in front of it. Because we know that that's the way human brains work. So, you know, an ad campaign that says just say no to drugs, it's not going to be effective. It's like my um, colleague uh, at Berkeley, George Lakoff, said, you know, he wrote a book called Don't Think of an Elephant. Well, if you understand what your brain just did when I said that, you don't need to buy the book because putting don't in front of something does not negate it in the mind of the audience. It amplifies it. So we have to be very careful about not amplifying the negative message of our adversaries with our own counter narrative. If we engage in counter narratives, it should be a part of an entire strategy. And the counter narrative should not refer to the adversarial narrative. Let me just throw something operational on top of that. And Gigi, I'm so glad you caught up on that because that's something I forgot about not repeating that. That was excellent. So let's talk about this operationally for a second. In Afghanistan, we would go out and do X number of targets every single night. And in the beginning, we wouldn't say anything. No public affairs, no press report. And then the Taliban would go, oh, we're just going to say that they killed a bunch of women and children. And then we'd have to scramble, shut down operations for a couple of days, a couple of weeks sometimes, until we cleaned up the mess, even though it wasn't true. What Gigi is trying to say, and what I'm trying to get through with this little story is, the lesson we learned is every single morning at the crack of dawn, we had a story out that said, you know what, last night we went out and got all these bad guys that were out there assaulting the local people and dishonoring your tribes and dishonoring the nation. And we, you know, the Afghan forces, the courageous Afghan forces leading this charge, they're the ones that are really protecting you. So we got ahead of the Taliban. And I think it was another five years before we lost another day operationally. And that's only because we were out and we did it every single day. So if you have a choice, I mean, every single morning, I bet every one of us either logs onto something or climbs in our car and turns on the radio and listens to our favorite news. And typically our favorite news is whatever our beliefs happen to be because we want somebody to narrate the news that happened last night while we were sleeping to us in a way that will trigger us to be interested in it. So we've already sucked down the meaning of what happened last night through people and sources that we trust to be similar to our beliefs. You know what? We do this every morning. We victimize ourselves with narratives. And how many people get up and they only read the Associated Press and Reuters. I don't know. Maybe I'm weird. I do, but <laughs> it's hard to avoid all the partisanship. But that's all narrative based. That's to keep people from drifting off and hearing a, a more compelling voice. And we have to literally be the radio announcers every single day in every environment that the US has some sort of a national security agenda. We have to be the narrator every single day talking about what our values are, what our cause is, what we're doing, why the ship's in port, why the planes flew over, why the troops are engaging with the medevac operation in the hills. We have to be explaining that the same way that, that radio announcer talks to each one of you every morning. Okay, you probably should go into the next one before I keep going. Yeah, I had a, um, a really interesting question from Tony F. And I think this is especially important as we deal with these disinformation campaigns right now. Um, and how do we counter that with our narrative? Um, if you look at the NATO planning cycles and trying to coordinate between our allies, and, and you can really move this over into the Southeast uh, Asian and indo pacom territory as well, as we work with our allies um, on these on these narratives, we kind of have a short term planning cycle, really. Um, so what how do we rectify that? How do we get over this 
short term kind of thinking to um, what is what is a longer term narrative and really how do we deal with our own differences politically, culturally um, with our allies? Um, is there is there a central goal that we can focus on? Jiki, I'll start with this one, if you don't mind, and you can, you can finish it up, please. Is that all right? Yes. Oh, oh there you are. Okay. The biggest problem we have with NATO is that we say one thing and we do another. And when this causes mass confusion in the heads of most audiences that we care about, we'll say we're the best thing that's ever happened to NATO. And we're there to, to support you to the end. And we know that you guys are going to support us. And then we do something that looks like we're beating up on them at the moment. And that's, it makes you crazy when you try to establish meaning from that. So your words have to meet your actions. And you have, even when you, you can't go along with everything that your allies are doing or and vice versa, you need to be explaining why. Because what happens, especially with NATO, and R Russia is really good at this, is they will jump into the vacuum and fill it with their meaning. Well, look at that. The U.S. doesn't get along with NATO anymore, and they're better off apart. Oh, dang. Now we have to counter narrative, and we don't have a compelling alternate narrative to build off of. So it's you got to get people's attention and hold it, or they wander off and find somebody that will talk to them. Anyway, GD, go ahead. No, I, I agree. I mean, I don't, I don't think I have anything to add to that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but but the crucial point is, if you don't put your meaning out, somebody will provide your information, the information with their meaning. And we are meaning-seeking creatures, so we're looking for it somewhere. And whoever gives it to us in a way that does something for our identities, especially, will influence us. No, those are, those are fantastic insights. And... I think this question is kind of interesting because we can measure um, tangible results from certain types of armor and artillery and, and kinetic effects. We can measure those results in terms of um, adversarial lives taken, in terms of equipment being destroyed. How do you, what, what kind of tangible results can you get from narrative? Because we're going to have senior military leadership that says narrative great sounds awesome but um i need to figure out relative combat power so how how do you measure the impact of narrative how do you get tangible results that's a good question it's hard it's like answering how to um how do you measure a negative um you know when you have stability but stability is relative so um, I'm not the best person to answer the question about how the DOD is going to be happy, you know, how, how best to make the DOD happy with results. Um, but I would just say that it is untangible. It is a bit, um, you know, I don't know that we're going to have numbers for them to count. Um, so, I, and I sort of think we should get comfortable with that ambiguity. Um, that might be what we need to work on is getting comfortable with that sort of ambiguity. I don't know. Paul, what do you think? Uh, a couple of things. Number one, I agree that there's a certain level of ambiguity we do need to get comfortable with. We have this obsession, in, especially within DOD, that we have to count stuff. So half the time, we end up counting things that don't matter and make decisions based on that instead of counting things that do matter. So this is my recommendation to the people that are in the influence business anywhere in the United States government. And that is take the formula that we've developed with the meaning, narrative equals meaning, plus identity, plus content, plus structure. Fine. When you sit down to do your initial analysis, cre create a list of specific items related to each. And you can establish a baseline in your analysis in the area that you're targeting. And then you, look at, you can look for indicators that it's moving in one direction or the other based on what you want to do. Because... Let's, here's an example. Again, it's an Afghan one because it makes it easy because if most folks have experienced it. If there are 47 tribes of a certain confederation in a district and sub-tribes and sub-clans and kells and all that, 
if only 12 of them were still respecting, because you understand, because you have an engagement with, with them, if only 12 have jurgas that are functioning because the Taliban's got too much influence, and if you are applying your narrative influence campaign, and in three months, you've got, let's say, 28 jurgas, functioning jurgas in communities, in that same area, you can measure the difference between where you were and where you're going. But you have to make the collection criteria, you have to pull from the collection criteria in order to be able to measure those things. Because if you don't, you won't know what those things are. Anyway, but like Gigi said, you know, we have to get over obsession with data. Data is really important, but humans understand behavior. We can teach, we can, through AI and machine learning, we can teach collection and data collection to collect and manipulate things so that we can see trends. But the humans that understand behavior are still going to have to develop the algorithms. And that's going to have to apply to specific people, specific leaders, specific, specific audiences, et cetera. No, that's fantastic. Thank you. I had... Um... Another question that I thought, and I apologize again for butchering your name, um, from a Boogie Chopra. Um, and the question is, um, how do you rectify in terms of how we consume information um, and how we adapt to information and what effect it has on us that, you know, generationally we have differences um in the ways we consume media and and the way we even even the way we take messages um between the boomers between the millennials and gen z um how do you think we have to change narrative do we have to tailor it generationally um do you think that's of interest mm. that was yours gg <laughs> if we want to influence then we do it depends what we want to do with our narrative um, if what we're talking about is that simple identity formation, you know, if I as a parent want to teach my kids how to take control of their narrative, uh, that's one thing. If what we're trying to do is influence the receiver, I don't like to use that term, but then, yeah, we have to change the narrative to, uh, or I would say change the story to best suit the narrative for the purpose. Um, depends what we're trying to do. Depends what the goal is and what kind of influence we're trying to have. Yeah, the only thing I'll add to that is that I'm just going to oversimplify what Gigi was saying. And that's every single narrative has got to be consumption and dissemination wise is tailored to a specific layer of narrative identity. The narrative identity of the audience that you're going after. So it's not just age. It's more about the specific identity of your tar target audience. And I would just add that the more identity layers that you can trigger, the better, the more influential. So we all have various identity layers, you know, personal on out. Um, to be influential, you want to trigger as many as possible. Great catch. Well, this has been fantastic. I'm going to do one more question. I apologize. We have a bunch of questions um, in the hopper, but based on us up against time, um, we'll have to save those for later. But uh, let me ask the last question I have here, and that is from, I'm so sorry, from Dr. Kirill Avmarov, uh, who's from UT Austin. Um, is it obvious that we're living in this we're, we're living in this environment where weaponized conspiracy theories are kind of standard issue um what methods or strategies work best when you're talking about this we already kind of talked about the the traps of counter narrative what are some of the ways we can mitigate cognitive damage or effects um of these cognitive bullets um and how, how do we incorporate that into narrative I think it would help, and I don't know which agency can do this other than, you know, civilians, um, to inform the American public about how what ne weaponized narratives are and how they operate, um, and to do so in a way that will be in understood as nonpartisan, uh, as just a psychological fact, um, you know, because there are there are methods, and, and and that's what we teach, and so. 
um, letting, you know, I call, we call it arming the sheep. I mean, letting the public know what those methods are so that they can recognize them is really important. A lot of people talk about, you know, critical thinking, and I, I'm, I'm not uh, knocking critical thinking, but, you know, my recent book was called Plato's Fear. Um, Plato was afraid that emotions will override the rational faculties. And that's what we're seeing. Um, if you can trigger people's identities and they have some investment in believing disinformation or weaponized narratives, um, it's pretty hard to shake that. What we have to do then is number one, teach them what those look like so they can recognize them. But number two, once they have taken hold, once those weaponized narratives have taken hold, the thing we have to do as narrators is tell a story that involves deeper meaning for the audience than the disinformation involves. So narrative is all about meaning making. It's all about imparting meaning to facts, to information. So we have to provide more meaningful meaning, more in-depth, more compelling meaning than the disinformation provided for that audience. Absolutely. I agree with you a thousand percent, Gigi. And the key to that is having more trustworthy narrators. I just as a just as, as a quick example, we had a we suffered in this country in just in the late 19th century with yellow journalism. And it just it snowballed. You had to have more sensational headlines, more nonsense, more bizarre captions and headlines and None of it was true. The problem is eventually nothing got done because it was all fantasy. It was all made up. So you can't solve problems with dishonesty. And eventually society just can't move forward. It is completely hobbled. And finally people demanded more truth. They demanded more journalists. They demanded stuff that they could act on and there's a natural cycle to this. We're coming to a point where we're going to have to agree on facts or we can't solve problems. You just can't say 47 and two equals a thousand because it doesn't. And if that calculation is what determines your paycheck gets to you or not, pretty soon you're going to go, no, nah, I'm not doing that math anymore. So there will be a natural reaction to all this. We just don't want to wait it out. We'd like to encourage it with as many trustworthy narrators as possible. Looks like we're up against the clock there, Luke. Yeah, well, I appreciate you guys coming on. I knew the discussion, um, as good as it is, we always like to keep it as a teaser because then they're going to come find you. Um, Gigi and Paul, where, where can they come find your work at and where can they come reach out as they have those follow-on questions? Sure. Um, they can look at our website, which is www.narrative-strategies.com. Um, you can get tons of our publications are there located for free. Um, you can uh, email us. We can reach our emails. Our line is AJIT at narrative-strategies.com. And Paul's is the same with his name in front. Um, we're on Twitter. You can follow Narrative Strategies on Twitter and Facebook. Fantastic. I know there's a lot of people in the audience right now that want to pick your brains. So uh, expect expect some contact after that. Um, I really want to thank both of you. This has been an excellent session. Uh, we are going to have this edited and, and out on our YouTube as well. So if you had to come in for part of it, you'll be able to view that later. Uh, as I said before, for our whole weaponization and information campaign, you'll be able to go back and look at all those videos all the events we've had please continue to engage with us this has been such a phenomenal experience you can follow us at army mad Sci on twitter or you can go to mad Sci blog .army .mil, and that is where uh, at our blog for the mad scientist lab we have two quick reads about the future every week on top of that we also have um, links to all our relevant content uh, to our all partners access network site and we're excited to announce um, on August 18th at 10 a.m. Eastern, we are going to be hosting um, Dr. Alexander Cott, who's the chief scientist for Armory Research Lab. Uh, we are also going to have Mr. Sam Bendit, who's an advisor for CNA. 
And then uh, Miss Melanie Rovery from Jane's, uh, who is the editor for Unmanned Ground Systems. We're going to have the future of unmanned ground systems. So we're going to have these three experts on to talk. Um, we're going to be looking at what autonomous systems look like in that vein. Uh, so that's another hour long panel that we're going to have. August 18th, 10 a.m. Eastern. Uh, so make sure Mr. Ian Kersey is going to put that in the chat here. So you'd be able to go on, register for that at Eventbrite, uh, and we're going to have that event coming up in the future. So again, I want to thank uh, our guests that came on today. Um, Dr. Mon, actually, I forgot to mention, is also a professor over at the Center uh, of, for, of the Future of War for Arizona State University. So you should probably enroll in those classes so you can get on. Um, uh, one of your students was on in our chat today so again thank you so much to everybody for coming out make sure you're following us reach out um and stay safe out there thanks thank you for everything luke and matt and everybody and ian see y'all later thanks